So my name is Dana. I've been coming here to Crossroads uh, since 2021. Um, this is my first time at one of the homesteading seminars. My kids are in ballet in the morning, so I'm usually over with them, but I'm really happy to be here. Um, I have the honor of speaking to you today about plants, specifically herbs. Um, so a little background about me. I'm not a doctor, and I'm not a certified herbalist, but I'm just someone who's really passionate about plants. Um, so I've been studying plants for the better part of 10 years. Um, I was just raised really conventionally. Um, when I was growing up, I had a lot of ear infections, strep throat, um, and I had um, as well um, ear and sinus infections. And I was on antibiotics probably twice a year since I was two years old maybe. Um, and that's every single year. So um, I, that did a lot to um, the way my body adapted. Um, so I did see a lot of health issues um, starting to arise from the um, use of antibiotics and the antibiotic resistance. Um, when I got to university, I went off and, and lived on, on my own. Uh, I started learning, uh, in one of my anthropology classes, I started learning about the hunter-gatherers, and it, it got my interest in um, alternative lifestyles, I guess, to what uh, we are, are used to here. And I uh, led me down the road of, of actually learning about folk herbalism. So within a couple of years of that, I actually put a pause on my formal education, and I started working for a medicinal plant company. Um, and then I, used, I was just studying natural medicine in my spare time. So fast forward to today, and I'm just going to share some of the things I've learned in the past 13 years. We'll start with what an herb is. So a lot of um, what I'll be talking about today is just really basic. If you have a good understanding of herbs, this might be a lot of stuff that you already know, um, but it's just kind of going through everything, everything that I know, everything that I find, would think would be useful. What is an herb? So the definition is a flowering plant whose stem above ground doesn't get woody, um, but the herbal, the more herbalism definition would be a plant that is valued for its medicinal properties, flavor, scent, or the like. So I personally use herbalism as an umbrella term for all plant medicines, not just the flowering um, leaf plants, but also bark and roots and everything. Um, so, therefore, herbalism is the study of these plants. This is just a basic um, overview of the parts of the plant. Um, so the, you see the dandelion there. Um, you have the flower, stem, and the leaf, which is in herbalism referred to as aerial parts. Uh, so if you're reading a recipe and it says use the aerial parts, you can use any of those or all of them. Uh, we, we can use the roots, bark, berries, skin and rind would be something like a citrus fruit, um, and the seeds. All of those can be used either dried or fresh. And there's different um, components, different constituents when you do dry an herb or use it fresh, and we can talk about that later. So why use herbs? These are a couple of my reasons and my whys. Um, they could also be considered some of the principles of herbalism, depending on who you talk to. Um, everyone has different principles about herbalism. One of them would be self-reliance um, or trusting ourself. Uh, we put a lot of trust into the medical systems that we're uh, that we have here in Canada, and a lot of us have been let down or um, impacted negatively from that. Taking personal responsibility for our family's health. Um, this one can be scary because it is a really big responsibility. It's, we get used to being able to rely on this doctor, this person. Um, we don't always trust ourselves to be able to do it and to take on that responsibility. Like You know what you're taking on. Um, it's the health of your family. We must remember that we were made to nurture our families and ourselves, and care for our families, and we are capable. By choosing herbal medicine, we're minimizing the risks of, of 
some serious side effects or some lesser, lesser side effects, and we're supporting the body's natural healing systems. So helping our community, um, what we, when we learn to become more self-sustainable, we're able to pass on that knowledge and wisdom to others, just like we're doing here at the Homesteading Seminar. In this, we can keep a local economy, we can spend less money, give less money to pharmaceutical companies, to supplemental companies, and we can keep all of that money and knowledge inside our community. Um, being in harmony with the nature, um, that means like around us and also within us, because we have all of nature inside of us as well. When we're working with our body's natural healing systems, then we're just not working against it. We're not suppressing the symptoms. We are listening to our bodies. Trusting God's medicine is uh, my personal <laughs> highest priority. Um, and as God says, let the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seeds, and fruit trees bearing fruit, in which in is their seed, each according to its kind on the earth. And it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed, according to their own kinds, and trees bearing fruit, in which is their seed, each according to, to its kind. And God said that it was good. Does anyone else have any other reasons why you're interested in herbalism, or any reasons why you have have studied herbalism in the past. That's something I haven't gone over. I covered them all. <laughs> so this is a little more practical. What can we use herbaliz herbalism or what can we use herbs for? So uh, one we're probably all used to is food. Um, herbs can be a great addition to our food or a great source of nutrients, supporting our body through disease, easing ailments like pain or itchiness or discomfort, fighting off of infections, um, hair care and body care, one of my favorite things to do with herbs, and nutritional supplementation. So for every pharmaceutical or toxic beauty product that we use, there is an herbal or otherwise plant version um, of that product. What can we not use herbalism for? That's pretty much it. <laughs> That's kind of a joke. <laughs> but I do um, come across a lot of people have concerns with herbalism because of its you know, role or uh, maybe in the media or the way that we see um, people using herbs. And they associate it with that, so they kind of want to stay away. Um, to that, I would just say that there are, are a lot of bad people who use good things for dark purposes, and we ought to redeem the, th the things that God created. So I'll just do a quick, um, just a quick overview of the uh, pharmaceuticals so we can compare. Um, I'm not going to read this whole thing. <laughs> But it says um, in an abstract just um, article online, the first medicinal drugs came from natural sources and existed in the form of herbs, plants, roots, vines, and fungi. Until the mid-19th century, pharmaceuticals were all that was available to relieve man's pain and suffering. The first synthetic drug, chloral hydrate, was discovered in 1869. It was a sedative hypnotic. The first pharmaceutical companies were spin-offs from textile and synthetic dye industry, and they owe much to the rich source of organic chemicals derived from the distillation of coal tar. The first analgesics and antipyretics, they were simple chemical der derivatives of the byproducts from coal tar. An extract from the bark of white willow, you might be familiar with this, um, it's been used for centuries to treat fevers and inflammation. The active principle in white willow is salicin or salicylic acid, and, and it has a bitter taste. Um, a simple chemical modification be, made that chemical more palatable. So that became a sal sal salicylic acid, better known as aspirin. That's kind of the, the history of uh, where pharmaceuticals <laughs> took off there. Um, and so what the pharmaceutical companies did to the medicinal plants to create them was 
basically alter the plant derivatives to make the components more potent and taste better. Um, they also isolated the component from the plant. Um, all of those things could arguably make the drug more dangerous, but it also makes the drug more effective depending on what you want. So the risk and benefit there, using the isolated constituents of a plant, a pharmaceutical drug, a pharmaceutical drug is usually designed to elicit a specific reaction, and its side or adverse effects are usually traded as a risk against the benefit of the primary effect, which is generally suppression of the symptoms. Herbal medicines usually tend to have several broad complementary or synergistic actions on a physiological system at the same time, which are usually in the same general therapeutic direction and often nonspecific. These actions are rarely adverse effects. Herbal medicine actions are too complex and usually cannot be adequately described using the vocabulary of medication actions, such as a diuretic. So synthetic drugs uh, address the symptoms caused by a specific disease as understood by a scientific pathology. However, an herbal medicine directs towards aiding the body's own healing process. Herbal medicines usually act gently and support the systems and processes that have become deficient or attempt to help remove excesses. Symptoms, um, symptom relief is only a small section of the medicinal plant's therapeutic strategy. For example, arthritis is usually treated with steroid anti-inflammatory drugs, which do have a widespread and well-known um, disturbing adverse effects. But the approach of herbs to these conditions is a little different, um, and that would cause, uh, be, be something like causing the moistening of <clears throat> dry synovia, stimulation of circulation in the affected area, facilitation of elimination via the kidneys, um, dietary modification, and et cetera. So herbs are considered safer as they do not suppress the symptoms, but they support the body's natural healing. <clears throat> that I just read. So, although, although herbs are considered safer, there are toxic plants, um, poisonous plants, that we would want to be careful of and consider. Some herbalists do use these plants in their preparations. I stay far away from toxic plants. That's not something that I'm comfortable doing, so I would leave that to an herbalist. But there are indications where something, a plant that would be considered poisonous would be useful in the, the healing of a uh, condition or support. So we'll go into types of herbs. So these are some of my personal favorites are the wild herbs. Um, this is just a small list of my favorites. And these are actually all local. You could all find all of these in our neighborhoods, in our um, backyards, in uh, forests, in fields. So the first one on my list and my favorite is plantain. And I have a funny story about plantain. I'm on the church baseball team. And that started in 2022, so only about six months after I started, uh, I started coming to Crossroads. Before that, I was so used to hanging out with my small group of friends that all studied herbs and all foraged all the time. Um, so I don't think I was really used to being out in public yet. Because when my teammate's daughter got stung by a bee, I immediately <coughs> dropped to my knees started looking around and yelled, has anyone seen any plantain? And my teammate looked at me, uh, gave me a really nervous laugh, um, and literally backed slowly away. <laughs> um, and he didn't talk to me for the rest of the game. <laughs> and uh, I don't think he thought it was that funny. I didn't realize until later on um, that, like most people would have, he likely thought that I was asking him if he'd seen the tropical fruit <laughs> in the grass. <laughs> so um, all that to say, if you start studying herbs, prepare to look a little bit crazy sometimes. <laughs> so plantain is my favorite, though, because it is so soothing. It instantly relieves bug bites, scraped knees, and cuts. So if you take a leaf, I have one here, and you can just take a piece, a fresh one off the ground, You'll see this everywhere. I'll actually show you. 
It's that one there, the big broad leaf with the lines on it. It's really easy to identify. It's in all of our um, probably sidewalks or cracks in our driveways. And you would just take a piece and you'd rinse it off. And you can crush it up or you can chew it, um, make a paste, and stick it on the bug bite or stick it on the scrape. And it will instantly draw out any bacteria. It relieves the itch immediately or the pain. And it will create kind of a, a soothing kind of Band-Aid. So we call it nature's Band-Aid. <laughs> one of my other favorites is nettle. That one is right beside the plantain on the top, beside the dandelion. So that's stinging nettle. Um, and you'll find that in forests, and a lot of people find that a big nuisance, but it's one of the most n nutritious plants. We can use it to eat, um, and uh, you can use it in teas. So it does sting if you touch it, but it doesn't last very long, and, and it's not dangerous. Dandelion, burdock, and chicory, I harvest all of these for their roots. They're amazing organ cleansers, especially when you use them together. Yarrow, I don't think there's anything yarrow can't do. I personally, one of my favorites. Um, I recently discovered that it has an enzyme in it that throws off the um, navigation of mosquitoes, making it an amazing bug repellent. Um, so that's something you think of if you uh, can infuse it into an oil and rub it on your skin, or you can make a spray out of it. Uh, if you try it, let me know how it goes. I'm going to try it this year. <laughs> Yarrow's the white flower. Or no, is that? No, that's elder flower. Yarrow's those white flowers in the bottom there. Um, St. John's warts the yellow uh, flower in the other corner. Um, it's a powerful nervine for... Um, anxiety support, as well as motherwort. Red raspberry leaf is, uh, and also motherwort, aid in womb toning. So it's really wonderful for pregnancy. Um, I used it for both of my pregnancies, and it just strengthens and tones the uterus. Um, so we have heal all, self-heal. That's uh, another one. It's the little purple flowers. They grow right in the grass, and sometimes... I mean, you're just walking over them in a, in a soccer field or something. You don't even notice them. They just seem like a weed, but they're really helpful for um, types of healing of the skin and, and cuts and wounds and things like that. Do you have a question? Is that on? Okay. Um, Dana, I had a question about the yarrow. Is it just the flower that you would make, the like, infuse into the oil, or would it be the plant, like, I would or the areola, the any of the areola? I would just use the flower. The flower, yeah. okay. Elderflower, we're probably a familiar, it's a pretty common um, elder, elderberry um, for immune system. So you can use the flower as well. So I harvest about half of my flowers, maybe a little less than half, and leave the rest for the berries. Um, it's, it works similarly to the berries. Um, I just really like the flavor. I think it's a really nice floral, so I can add that into teas. Um, I use pine needles for... Uh, Vi uh, vitamin C and the, vo the volatile oils that are released when you steep a pine needle is really good for respiratory health. So you can even, um, if anyone has ever steamed pine needles in uh, just a pot and breathe that steam in, it's really good if you have congestion in your respiratory system. And mullein as well. That is um, really soothing for your respiratory system and for coughing. Yeah. We, that we discovered is... There's only one pine needle yet that you can use. It's the one with the five. The white pine? Yeah. 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 That's, that's the only one because uh, you can't use the other ones. Uh, and then with yarrow, we are using the leaves as well. Yeah. I cut my finger, put it on there. Within seconds, the blood was, uh, because it's the blood. Uh, uh, so, Amazing. Yeah. yeah. So I just want to add that. Thank you. Yeah. So the leaves are um, for wound healing. Amazing. So that's our foraged herbs. Again, there's like hundreds more, but kitchen herbs now. Okay, so um, 
as the name implies, kitchen herbs are things we all probably already have in our kitchens. Um, and this is probably my favorite place to start because there, there isn't something on that list that you're not able to, to find if you go into your pantry. And all of these have amazing healing qualities. So I won't go over what every or one of those herbs does uh, in terms of its uh, actions and functions, but some things like I would do, I'll make sage and oregano tea throughout the winter. There's a reason why that's kind of um, sage, oregano, thyme for chicken noodle soup. It's not just for, oh, that's the flavor of it. It's because it's actually doing something for us. So the food that we're eating is, is medicine for us. And that those are things that if we eat a lot of those herbs throughout the winter, that's going to help keep us healthier. Um, obviously, uh, some of these have aromatic qualities like lavender, rosemary, like, they're just amazing. And these are ones that I would probably choose to plant in my garden. So some of these are native and some of these are not. Um, roses are great for, um, they're actually great for immune system and um, for calming. California poppy is one of the ones. So if you've heard like chamomile, uh, chamomile's up there, really good for calming and helping sleep. If you need a step up above that, you could find something called California poppy. Um, yeah, so an echinacea and bee balm, those and marshmallow as well, could be on the foraged or wild herbs list as well. Um, they're all native plants. The, the reason I didn't put them on there and why I put them into the, the garden is because I don't personally find a lot of those when I'm out foraging. I don't know if anyone, if you, if you guys do. Echinacea is supposed to be a native plant, but I just don't see it while I'm out. So um, that's something that we need to be aware of, like keeping in our gardens, um, as well as bee balm and marshmallow, which marshmallow might be a little bit easier to find. So there's something called herbal actions, and that's just like the drug effects. They're not actually working in the same way that drugs do, but they each have, um, all herbs have, an a have actions. But the thing is that, like one of the quotes I um, quoted from previously, one herb is not going to do one thing. You're not going to take sage just because it helps clear mucus. Like it's, they're all going to have a broad spectrum of actions. Um, so we, when we think of, oh, take elderberry for immune, like it's working in that function, but it's not just working in that function. So these are just kind of an overview of the actions. Um, you might have heard something called an adaptogen. This is kind of a trendier word lately, I feel like. Um, it basically, like the name implies, just uh, it helps our bodies adapt to stress. Um, it's just it's from non-toxic plants and mushrooms, and adaptogens exhibit neuroprotective, anti-fatigue, antidepressant, nootropic, and central nervous system stimulating activities. Although they, there are studies behind these plants performing these activities, it's still not known what exact substance, substances are in these plants that are responsible for these activities. So while they are documented to, to help relieve stress, it's still not really known why. These herbs restore overall balance and strengthen the functioning of the body as a whole, but they don't act on individual organs or body systems. They could be stimulating or relaxing. They may help improve mood, and they help our immune system. One that you might have heard of, well, ashwagandha is one. Reishi mushroom, or, or, or all sorts of different mushrooms, and uh, holy basil. Bitters are for aid in digestion. That's a, a pretty easy one to incorporate. A lot of herbs are bitter, as well as bitter greens, so dandelion leaf is a great one to add to salads to help get our digestion flowing, to help our bile release, um, and help with peristalsis. Uh, just, a dr just even a drop of a bitter flavor, so if you make a tincture out of a bitter herb, and even just one drop on the tongue actually is shown to activate the production of bile and an enzyme flow. Um, so really important and something I think with uh, anyone with any digest digestive issues, needs to start there because 
we're not preparing, prepping our body for eating a lot of the time. We've kind of pushed the bitter herbs to the side. They don't taste very good. So we kind of need to add those back in. There's a lot. Artichoke, orange peel, a lot of different herbs. Astringent is the sour feeling or the puckering that you might feel uh, eating an herb or drinking a tea. So they actually help shrink tissues and it helps create barriers. They're really good for your gut health to shrink the um, mucous membranes, to help tone the mucous membranes. But alter alternatively, too many tannins, which is the substance that's um, in astringent, found in a lot of astringent herbs, um, too much of that can have a negative effect. Uh, you can feel it in your stomach, you might feel it in your face. I think astringents are, uh, it's pretty easy to navigate because your body will tell you when you've had too much. If it's too much of a puckering feeling, if you're feeling like tightness in your stomach, it's like, okay, we've had too much of that, of that tea. I feel it a lot when I drink teas. Um, for me, it almost makes me feel thirsty after I've drank it because I'm like the tightening of my mouth. Um, alternative herbs are just uh, an addition, additional action um, that I, I find one of my favorite ones is cleavers. If you've seen uh, in your backyard or out in the ones that stick to you when you're trying to put, do some weeding, um, they have a Velcro-like consistency and they're really good for promoting lymph flow, so you can eat those or you can make a tonic or a tea out of them. So nervines, uh, like the name implies, work on the nervous system. Um, they're known for their calming effects. Um, just because it's a calming herb doesn't mean it's a nervine, doesn't mean it's working on the nervous system in the way that some of these herbs do. So that would be our chamomile and California poppy, like I mentioned, um, but also lavender, lemon balm is a great one. Oh, car carminative, uh, it's just a, another digestion support. Peppermint and ginger are probably ones we uh, are most familiar with, the things that you can find in the store if you're looking for a digestive tea. Demulsants are some of my favorites because when I'm feeling sick or my kids are feeling sick, I like to use demulcents because of their um, mucilaginous or oily uh, feature. Uh, they produce kind of a goo. So if you actually make a tea, you'll feel it on the tea bag or you can actually feel it if you've wet the herb or the seed. Um, that goo coats, soothes, and protects the mucous membranes. So really good if you have irritation of the throat. Um, just immediate relief. <laughs> So the slime action triggers a reflex that helps promote the natural moistening secretions within the body. Um, they're best extracted in a fusion of water, so really just great to do for teas with. Um, amazing for sinus, throat, and even gut support. Some of my favorites, marshmallow, root, plantain, slippery elm, which is in one of the throat coat teas you can find in the stores. Um, and diaphoretics. Raise body temperature. So I think these are really interesting because you're using them to heat, but they actually can have a cooling effect if that's what you need. So if you have a fever and you take cayenne, it will actually promote your body to sweat, which will cool you down if that's what you need. If your body's internal temperature is too cold, it will simply heat you up. So I think these are really powerful um, herbs or additions to tea or food, garlic, ginger, um, and cayenne, obviously. Diuretics support kidneys, help urinate. Um, so again, cleavers, dandelion. Emollients are also um, mucilaginous, but they are for topically. So aloe vera, marshmallow is a really good one. Those are just for skin irritation. Okay, I think these are our last... Um, Actions are expectorants. So expectorants uh, help encourage productive coughing. Again, one of my favorite. I use these all winter. <laughs> um, they break up the mucus in the lungs and expel it more effect effectively. So they, for me, I've noticed they do reduce the length of a cough or cold or whatever. 
significantly. Um, some expectorants are mucilaginous or soothing, while others are irritating. So it's depending what you need. If you, um, if you have mucus stuck in your chest, you're going to want an irritating herb to help break that up and get it out. Um, whereas if you just kind of have that irritating, persistent cough, you want something that's going to be soothing. Um, a, lot are, a lot of the spe expectorant herbs are both. Um, so you have mullein, which is a soothing herb, uh, and then uh, hyssop is more of an irritating, or something like, what do I have here? Um, like licorice root would be both. Slippery elm, again, soothing. Tonics are a nutrient dense, so I would use these daily if you need to have, um, if you have deficiencies. These are ones that you would make into tincture or you could make them into some infusions and you would take those daily for supplementation. Um, and they just are used to help tone and strengthen the body systems. You could make out of, I mean, my favorite is nettle if I'm gonna make an infusion. I think it's so mineral rich. That, that's just what I would go to. Uh, but you can make them out of dandelion, milk thistle, um, is great for liver, moringa leaf, oat, to oat tops or milky oats is one that I've been recommended as well. And these are just some basic definitions. Okay, so an extraction, which is the process in which phytochemicals and nutrients are extracted and pulled from the plant. Um, something you're gonna find throughout reading and researching about herbalism. Um, that's all it is, is, just pulling out the nutrients from the plant. That's defined by the solvent used to do so. So you can have a water extraction, oil extraction, um, alcohol extraction. Um, an infusion, so that's basically just what you would make a tea, you're doing an infusion, um, using water, oil, or solvents to draw out the vitamins, enzymes, and you're infusing them into that substance. The, a tea is uh, specified by the um, length of time that it would be steeping or it would be infusing. So obviously tea is an infusion in water, but it's less than 20 minutes. Um, whereas a de decoction is pulling out more nutrients, uh, might be used for different herbs. So some herbs are kind of very fragile and, and they don't need a lot of time. Even too much time or too much heat would be damaging to them, whereas others you won't get the full effects if you're not doing a longer. But you could also say, I'm using this tea just for the taste, I'll do five minutes, but then if I wanna steep it for an hour, I'm gonna be getting like the full range of benefits. Um, and that would be 20 minutes plus, but it can be also like hours of, um, of steeping in, in boiled or like simmering water, or you could just do it in hot water that cools down naturally. That would be ideal so a tea would be more ideal for, um, like I said, like the aerial parts of your plant and, and delicate parts, but a de decoction's great for roots, berries, and bark. Um, even dried mushrooms um, that need, they need more time. If you, if you steep like a piece of chaga mushroom or bark for 20 minutes, you're getting almost nothing out of it. So you're gonna want to really simmer that sometimes for hours. So it really just depending on the plant that you're using. And, if you get it from a company, it's gonna tell you the time. If not, if you just get the raw, you can just look up all the times. It's all, it's all online. Um, so a tincture is specifically an herbal extraction using 80% or more alcohol. I have interesting information. I might at the end go over a little bit more in depth about tinctures. Um, but one thing to know is that 80 to 100%. If it's anything less, it's not going to extract the same. Um, anything more is unnecessary, so 80 to 100%. And anoxamol is really um, one of my favorite. I just like the, um, the flavor. I, like, I just like the way that it, that it works. It's an extraction using vinegar and honey. Um, and these are great for herbs that don't taste very good. Um, I, I don't know if anyone has heard of fire cider before. Yeah, so that's something that's using an oximal. It's using a mixture of one, um, equal parts honey to vinegar. Um, the honey is going to add its own benefits as well as the vinegar. So I like that it's, um, whereas an alcohol tincture is using only the plant 
this is adding the benefits of honey and vinegar, um, but it's also masking the taste a little bit. So you can even just do um, garlic I've done with a, uh, an infusion in, in vinegar and honey. Okay, so we have hydrosol, and this is another fun one. Um, so you could either infuse your plant into water, into boiled water, and that will make like, so if it's flowers, um, it will make a flower water, and that will have all of the components to the plant, the scent is what you really want. But then if you want a more pure version of that, and something that's going to be more sh self shelf stable, you can make a hydrosol. So that's using distillation. Um, so basically what you do is you would Boil, uh, boil water and have a bowl sitting inside with no water in it. Um, and you're using condensation, the distillation, so you put a, the lid upside down on top of the pot with ice on top. So the steam hitting the ice is actually going to, um, so the herbs are in the hot water. And the, uh, the evaporation of the, or the steam with all of the good plant aromatics and components in there is actually going to distill into that bowl. And you get, you're left with this really pure water um, that is like a really nice fragrance. It's an alternative to essential oils, which are extremely potent and, um, and strong. This is the alternative to that. It will have small amount of essential oils in it, but also has all the other plant matter in it as well, but pure, so you can leave that out. Um, not worry about it going bad like if you were to use just an infusion. And a salve is where you're infusing your herb into oil. Oh, and I said here the essential oil is the dis distillation, but you're separating the, the volatile oils from the top and you're just using the oil part. Um, and a salve is herb infused oil to create ointments. I just am, um, have listed some common ailments. Any ailment you can think of is going to have an herbal um, remedy for it. These are just ones that I personally have experience with and that I use. Um, so I, I could go through, but headache is one that I've, if it's a minor headache, I can, I can manage with herbs. I'm still learning how to manage with a stronger headache. If anyone has any advice like, for something like a migraine, I'm open to hearing it. Um, ear infections are one that I've found really easy to treat at home with herbs um, or even, even without herbs. Um, something I like to choose is garlic. Um, so that's something that we have ear infections you know, I have two, two little girls. Um, I've never had to use anything be beyond herbs with them. I'm really grateful for that. Anxiety, uh, something, allergies. Um, nettle is also a great antihistamine. Cough, chest phlegm, joint pain, acute wounds, like I said, the plantain, inflammation in general, and um, organ support. So there's blends that I'll take for things like liver support, things like that. And it's about a little bit about growing herbs, which Jen mentioned. Very, very easy to grow herbs in your garden. I would say they're one of the easiest plants to grow in general. I've tried all sorts of things in my garden from fruit to vegetables, and if I could, I would just, just grow herbs. <laughs> um, they're, they're very low maintenance. Um, I would say the only downside is that if you are growing from seed, they take significantly longer, um, which for someone who may be not as prepared um, or maybe a little impatient, that might not be the best uh, route to take. But it is a little bit difficult to find more than just kitchen herbs as seedlings. I find I've gone to like all sorts of greenhouses. Um, so if that is something you want more, m more of the kind of garden or medicinal version of the herbs, to go maybe try, um, try getting them from seed. Like Jen said, keep mints contained. 
Um, some herbs like to spread very rapidly. And uh, yeah, I let a lot of my herbs go to seed and then I find them all over the garden <laughs> throughout you know, the years. So uh, it could be fun if that's what you're into. <laughs> if you like a clean and tidy garden, then chop them and keep them in their own space, keep them in containers. Um, but like uh, Jen said as well, some will overwinter. Um, so just make sure they have a good spot to do so or you can bring them in. My favorite way to garden with herbs is native perennials. So I plant all native uh, flowers in my garden and use the roots, echinacea. Um, I'll keep plantain and all, just all the weeds that I find, I like to keep those in my garden. And as well, if it's not something you don't have space or it's not, not something you want to do, um, you could solely be a uh, herbalist using herbs just from what you forage. It doesn't need to be something that you grow, something you maintain. You have the option. So some resources. Um, so bulk herbs in Canada. For medicinal flowers, like native flowers, I actually go every year to Reforest London, which is on Wellington Road, um, just behind Westminster, Westminster Ponds area. So they have a native plant sale every year. Um, for uh, to just goes back into their organization. Um, so that's great. That's partially medicinal. There are some medicinals, and then a bunch are just native for the bees and pollinators. So always a good thing. <laughs> it's coming up soon. It's in May. Yeah, it's, um, so the, the plant sale is in May. Um, yeah? There is a place where you can get medicinal herbs plants, and that's Richter's. Richter's, Okay. Good to know. So you can get medicinal plants, like as seedlings, yeah? Medicinal plants from Richter's. So we'll look into that. Um, the rest of the companies all there are all just dried, so um, dried bulk herbs. Some people prefer to go that way in herbalism. Instead of growing anything at all, you just buy big bags of herbs and you make your tinctures and whatnot. Um, so the ones that I have recommendations for that are legitimate, because one thing you need to be wary of is sourcing herbs. Um, you just need to know where they're coming from, their, their sustainability, like how they're harvesting. Um, and also non-organic non and also maybe herbs that you'd find from the grocery store. There's a risk that they use irradiation to kind of, what do you, uh, clean them, I guess, to preserve them. Um, you don't want irradiated herbs, they're going to have no nutrients in them. So you want something that's going to be grown, dried, and sent to you, and without alteration. So that's something to be aware of. It's, it's not always as easy as just going to the grocery store and grabbing out your herbs, um, because you want to make sure that they're quality. So these are all recommended, and ones that I've used. I use organic matters quite often. And like it says at the bottom, that local plant stores for herbs, right, um, like seedlings. Just make sure you know their practices. You can talk to the people that you're buying them from. Um, yeah, seeds as well. So three of these seed companies that you can buy from Canada, there are, I'm sure, a lot more. These are just ones that I know, like, that are quality, but I, there's a lot. You just have to do your research. One thing about salt spring seeds, um, and maybe others that you'll come across as well, is that they specifically do sell toxic plants for sale. You need to know which ones are toxic. They might look pretty, but you need to know that might be a poisonous plant. The reason for them selling poisonous plants is because they actually sell to um, for homeopathy, which is like the extreme dilution of these plants. So they, these, aren't use, these aren't people using these plants for um, to, uh, in herbalism here for the most part. Um, so you need to be aware when you're buying, like, what, obviously what you're buying and not to get mixed up because you don't want to be growing, you know, deadly nightshades in your garden for your kids to maybe pick and try and stuff. Um, so just be mindful of that. Uh, they're, they're more selling towards professionals, I guess. Um, so some tools. It's very easy to start with these. I... Start, I started with nothing, like what's in my kitchen, like little jars. That's pretty much all you need. Um, but if you do want to do a little bit more larger scale, uh, I would recommend a stainless steel funnel. 
is something I've not gotten yet and something that I think about often. Um, bottles, if you're going to get bottles for tinctures, um, try to get the amber glass bottles. Those are going to be the best. They're not going to leach anything into your tincture. Um, so they're strong enough to withhold that alcohol, and they're going to be tinted, so it's going to keep your tincture fresher longer. Um, and then you have your a cheesecloth for straining the herbs. Um, better than a, you know, a, a mesh strainer. It's, it won't let as many of the little parts through. Um, and I like to use drying screens. So obviously, if you're, if you're harvesting a bundle of herbs, you can, like this is for growing herbs, but... Uh, if you do grow your own. Yeah, tying them up and hanging them all over, but like bits fall over. I don't harvest that cleanly a lot of the time. I'm pulling leaves off, so I need somewhere flat to lay them. I just use old screens from windows, um, but you can go online. You can get like drying racks that are nice and organized and that will hang from the ceiling. Um, they're just kind of all mesh. Like there's a lot available, but I would recommend if you do decide to grow, um, some of these herbs grow prolifically and they'll you know you'll have way too much by the end of the year and you're going to want to dry them and you're going to want to dry them right so they don't get moldy so I would invest if you're growing any significant amount of herbs to invest in one of the drying racks or even just DIY yeah so some books um I I've studied herbalism from a lot of different people from years and years ago so I have a lot of uh, knowledge. I've had to kind of discern. A lot of herbalists will kind of teach things that um, might fall uh, more too far into the folk herbalism that'll be something that you might not resonate with. Um, so just use discernment when you're finding herbalists to follow. Um, but these are ones that I've been recommended um, that are all Christian herbalists, except for the very last one there. But keep in mind, I have not read the books, um, the first six there. They're all by Christian herbalists, so I just know that they're by Christian herbalists. <laughs> um, I would like to read them, and I'll let you know how they are if I do. But the last book, although like Alchemy of Herbs could be um, an interesting title, but she's one of the most amazing herbalists. Um, very neutral, so don't be put off by the name. If you do want to read that book, I would highly recommend it. It's one of the ones I've read. So in conclusion, synthetic drugs address the symptoms caused by specific diseases as understood by scientific pathology. However, an herbal medicine directs towards aiding the body's own healing processes. Herbal therapy requires patience. It isn't a one-size-fits-all approach, nor will herbs target a specific problem or eliminate and mass discomfort altogether. The use of herbs in medicine does require faith. It allows us to trust ourselves more and trust God more. Growing herbs is a very easy way to nourish our families. It doesn't take a lot of resources, it doesn't take a lot of space, and it really doesn't take a lot of effort, um, but you can just add that to something that's nourishing your family. It connects us with nature, and it reduces our dependence on the current systemic medical industries. I would like to now just do a little demonstration if you're interested. Um, on what I would do if I was making a couple of these uh, preparations. Um, because like I said, it's very easy. It's not much to show. Um, but this is something I was going to get a little bit more into tincture. So the reason why tincture may be superior is that alcohol, as a solvent, is able to extract both fat-soluble and water-soluble vitamins. Um, or soluble molecules from the herb, plus a wide range of the plant constituents, arguably more than any other solvent. In terms of how much of the beneficial plant chemicals are to be extracted, so alcohol does the best job. The alcohol tinctures work the quickest on our body, so it is something for acute, um, acute pain or an acute condition. You might want to consider a tincture before other um, extraction methods. Um, so it's very fast, fast acting. Um, it's absorbed through the mucous membranes directly into the bloodstream. So al alcohol tinctures will buy 
will bypass, any extraction will bypass, you know, the fact of uh, just chewing up and eating the plant. Um, you're actually going to bypass that digest digestive system and go straight into your bloodstream where it, the plant's going to work. And as a tincture, when you're dropping it into your mouth, the process actually starts happening the second it, it touches your mouth. That's how quickly it starts to act. Um, the medicinal properties of the herbs and the alcohol tincture, tincture can start their amazing work right away. Another reason why tincture, alcohol tinctures might be preferred is that they're very well preserved. Um, so tinctures based in alcohol last a long time, could be up to years. Um, and you can use them as quickly or as, you know, as little as you want. You don't have to use them up, all up at the same time as when, once they're opened, as long as they're stored in a dark and cool place. Okay, so if I'm using, this is oregano that I harvested last year. If you're using a dried plant, the only thing to really remember is that you're going to want to use a bit less because the water, the alcohol is going to expand your, is going to expand your, uh, the plant. So if I'm using one full jar of um, fresh oregano, I'd probably use half, maybe three quarters. Um, there doesn't have to be exact measurements. It's pretty much filling up your jar with the plant. So I'm not, and I'm going to crush as well because uh, fresh or when fresh or dried, you're going to want to break it up just so more of the plant is available. And you don't need to crush it extremely fine or anything, you're just going to want to break it up. And that way you really know how much you're getting in there as well. So basically for a tincture, it's just this. Filling up just about half and taking your 80% alcohol and you're going to fill it to the top. And one thing I did forget, well, no, actually, you're going to want to use either a plastic lid or a, you're just going to want to use a spoon or something and like get it all in there, a plastic lid or maybe a piece of wax paper or something because, yeah, as you probably know, these jars can rust and the alcohol will really bug them. So I would use a plastic lid if you have it. And then you're going to let that sit for two to four weeks with a uh, aerial or a soft um, herb with something like Bark, you're going to want to go up to eight weeks. So um, you're going to sit that and let that, that's when all of the constituents will be pulled out. And then another option that we have is another really easy one. Yeah. Go ahead. So when you leave that sitting, is it supposed to be out of the sunlight, in the sunlight? Out of the sunlight. Out of the sun. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, just a cool dark place. Um, yeah, you can, yeah, and you, you, as, as you're waiting throughout the days, you'll just want to mix it up. Make sure everything is all incorporated. Like you take it every day? Yeah. I don't, but <laughs> sure, <laughs> ideally. Um, for this, I'm taking my elder flowers. And I'll fill up my jar. Um, just I would just get it online. Can you repeat the question? If you were getting 80% alcohol, um, I would just order it online. Yeah. I don't know where in the city like I, you could get it. <laughs> I'm not sure. So You can go to the LCBO. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, LCBO could a good A good vodka yeah. or, like, a white rum. Okay. Or yeah. both, should be both 80 LCBO. I, see, I don't do alcohol, so I'm like, <laughs> yeah. You can do, with the Oximals, you can do whatever ratio you really prefer. Um, but I usually just do a one-to-one. -one. So I would do 
about half with honey. And I really like to eyeball, but then you would do half vinegar. And again, you'll want your plastic, plastic or some sort of wax paper. You can mix it up before you put in your plant or you can just shake it up and get it all mixed in. And then that will be nice and, and so you're going to want to basically just fill, cover, just to cover it. So you can do your one-to-one. -one. This just needs a little more vinegar. And there you go. And so this can sit for, again, you're going to want this to sit for at least two weeks to infuse. And the longer it sits, the more you're going to get out of it. Yeah? And then what? And then how do you use it? This one, you're... The, they're, you're just going to strain them both. Yeah. So you're going to use um, your cheesecloth and your funnel into whatever container you want with a tincture. It's going to extract so much and be so potent that a lot of people do like to use the dropper bottles. And then they're both shelf stable. So you can just keep them in the bottles. Use um, with tinctures, depending on what's the purpose, if it's something that you need a little bit more help with, um, you can take it multiple times a day. And usually for just the regular herbs that we're gonna be using, it would be about two droppers. It's really based on you know the size of the person with a kid. Kids can take tinctures just fine, but you're only gonna wanna use maybe half of a dropper, whereas a full-grown adult man might take three full droppers worth. Um, a couple times a day, depending on how you feel, the relief that you're getting, and you can kind of go based on that. Oh, go ahead. Oh, um, I use one drop, and if it doesn't work within a half an hour, then I do a second drop, mm. and I just keep doing that until I get the desired effect. Right. And then I write that on the bottle for myself. Mm -hmm. So That's a I'll, great way to do, I'll it. do the same thing for my husband and yeah. typically I assume this is more for more. pain for pain related it's or? for anything yeah it, lungs pain right. joints Any whatever symptom. yeah so and it works really well that mm -hmm. way yeah I'm someone, that, I'm someone that remembers by a story can you tell me of like a time that you actually like were, you were had a symptom like what was your symptom Just because that'd be more specific so I get migraines Thank you. And I will take one drop of fever few, and then I'll wait 15, 20 minutes, take another drop of fever few, and I keep doing that until the headache starts to recede. Then I know that's my dose. By drop, do you mean literal drop? Like or drop. Like no, drop, drop. I'm very sensitive, so for me, it's a drop. And you don't know that until you try it, mm -hmm. so don't start with a dropper full. Is there any other questions? Um, I'm using apple cider vinegar. Yeah, my question was if there is a specific kind of vinegar that would be better to use than other ones. Yeah, so I would use apple cider vinegar because we're using it to the same extraction as any other vinegar, but you get more benefits from the apple cider vinegar. The apple cider vinegar with the mother. Yeah. Because there's two different ones. That's right. With the mother. Anything else? Do you have a specific source for where you get your alcohol? Like, give me a website <laughs> where I can, I can order. <laughs> if you have one. No, so I have used alcohol for tinctures in at one time and it was given to me by a friend so I actually don't have a source for the 80% but did we hear someone saying yeah if you go to the LCBO um, and just go and get uh, just be aware if you have food allergies because um, like if you're going to do like a vodka there's ones that are potato wheat corn mm -hmm. um, so but the label 
on the counter in front of the bottle will tell you what it's made out of. But just a the cheapest bottle of vodka or rum, it doesn't need to be name brand or anything. As long as it says 40%, that's an 80 proof. Mm -hmm. So it needs to be 80 proof. If it says 50%, that's 100 proof, um, if that makes sense. One sec. Um, I've just been trying to figure out the tincturing thing for a while, and I'm, I keep getting hung up on the actual purchasing of the alcohol. Like, I want to do bigger quantities, and I have been to the LCBO, and they have, like, a small bottle for, like, $50. So I'm like, where can I get, um, like, a high-proof, you know, alcohol that, yeah, the that state. is in a bulk, you know, and, mm -hmm. and good money-wise? The duty-free shop on the way back from the state. Yeah. Yeah, if you do any traveling, um, honestly, the lower south you can go, the cheaper it is. Like, Tennessee, if you can make it that way, is, like, we got two liters for sixteen ninety nine. Yeah. And, and, then, and then that's what we use it for. And then it'll, it'll last you. Oh, hold on. And just to clarify, is it 80% or 80 proof? Yeah, and everything 80, like everything that you'll read, I'll say 80%. Okay. Um, but whether or not that's. <laughs> yeah. So uh, we do, I've always done my tinctures with 80 proof. Yeah. Which is technically f like 40% is 80 proof. Yeah. I could be wrong. Some sources online say that that's too low. Um, I would say it's more for the quality of the extraction. I don't think, like, if you made it with a lower percentage, it's not going to not work. It's just, I think those are the sweet spots, so you're gonna want a higher percentage, but um, I, I've not done tinctures as much as everything else, so it's not something I've really, like, played around with or practiced very much, yeah. Um, you had a list of a different Oh, you had a list of different ailments at the beginning, and that you've used herbs to address a lot of those. Would you be able to let us know um, some of your secrets? If we went through that list, uh, you mentioned that ear infections you used garlic for. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, awesome. that's a garlic-infused oil. Um, so that's I do a, a quick infusion, but you can infuse an oil for a prolonged period of time. Um, but I find even just, like, because I don't always have it on hand, I'll make it and within half an hour I'll use it and it will provide a relief. So an ear infection, um, is there anything specific or just going through them? Yeah, so anxiety specifically, that's when I would use the Nervines and I would use um, chamomile and I would do infusions that way. Um, I, I really like to do de decoctions, so I'll get blends of nerve-supporting teas, and I'll steep them for prolonged periods of time, really, um, and just keep that on hand. Um, I find that's like a stronger than just like steeping a cup of chamomile tea. Um, so there's blends that I'll actually buy, or then the, or I'll mix my herbs that I have that are nerving. So that would be Dana. <clears throat> If you're steeping something for a long period of time, um, are you supposed to keep it like in the fridge or something? I find sometimes if I steep my nettle tea for too long, it stinks. It's, it stinks? It stinks. Like it, <laughs> I, oh, like it's gone off? Yeah, like, but I'm just like leave it on the counter. I'm like, yeah. what's going on there? It, 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 are there certain things you can leave out and certain things you can't? Or are you supposed to like, If it's just for a couple of hours, them? it doesn't matter. But if you're doing something, yeah, overnight. Like for a decoction, you, are you supposed to put it somewhere else, like if it's storing, if it's steeping for, you know, more than yeah, 12 it, hours? Yeah, I would put it in the fridge then, if it's going to be that long. Um, inle yeah, unless it's simmering on the stove that whole time, that's obviously safe. But, yeah, I, I would be cautious about keeping things overnight. Um, oh, yeah, I have a list there of the ner Nervines. Um, so a couple of other nervines that you can find easily, um, besides 
chamomile. So California poppy is something that's not as common. Um, you can still find that online. Um, hops is a really powerful nervy, and I assume that's why they use hops in beer. Um, it has that calming effect. Uh, lavender, lemon balm, and passion flower, something you can find in the store, not something native. Um, passion flower is really powerful for calming anxiety. Um, so I will, and rose, I also like to use for that. So yeah, there's just a lot. Um, you can play around with your blends, see what kind of works for you um, in terms of anxiety. And uh, for, for sinuses, so I like to do a lot of steam. Um, so like I said, I'll use the white pine, I'll use rosemary, peppermint, um, so these have uh, respiratory benefits, and I'll actually steam them over a pot of water, um, put, uh, put the boiled water in a, in a bowl, and then a towel over my head, and breathe in that steam, so I'll breathe in the herbs, um, as well as using as a tea. Um, nettle is a really good anti-inflammatory, so I find when I have that sinus pressure, um, I do a lot of nettle just constantly <laughs> throughout the whole time. Yeah, as a tea. Um, or I'll let it steep, you know, long and have that and just warm it up. For a cough, depending what it, what it is, I would do melon um, for almost any cough. Uh, black licorice root, marshmallow root, slippery elm. Um, these are blends that you can get as a, as a blend or you can mix them yourself. So that's just really soothing for the throat. And um, it supports the, uh, you know, I want to always expel mucus. So I actually do like a honey and sage tea. That's like my go-to, like especially if I'm just not feeling like, you know, mixing up stuff. I'm just like sage. That's, that's, I always have it on hand. Um, so that'll help a lot with expectorant releasing that mucus. So I find that the most helpful. Um, joint pain, something that I've played around with would be with turmeric. Um, that's like a uh, turmeric and actually ginger also is known. So I, I'll mix those uh, ginger and turmeric together. So that's kind of joint pain and inflammation in one, right? So it works on any sort of infl inflammation. I have found relief with headaches. Um, high doses of ginger contain um, a chemical that's known to, um, well, and as well as anti-inflammatory, it actually affects the pain receptors. So that's something interesting. Um, I actually will high, high dose ginger and do like chopped up half a teaspoon every, and I'll do the same as Donna explained about um, finding your, uh, what you need. Um, and that's like with, with all herbs, like it's very much you need to listen to your body. It's not a dose as, as some herbalists will give you a, a bit of a more structured if you're going in for a protocol, but it, there'll still be room for, is your body responding to this? Yeah, take a, start small and build up. But so for me personally, I'll start with like a good chunk of ginger and take until I start to feel the relief. So that could be two times, that could be, you could take it 10 times. Um, I usually have to take a little bit more, but see what works for you, how your body is reacting. Um, with the bug bites, really all I've ever needed to use is plantain. <laughs> you don't need to dry anything else, it's perfect. And for organ support, there's, um, uh, it, it's whatever issue you have, there's an herb for that. For me, it's something um, is liver functioning. I need a lot of liver support. Um, so I'll take milk thistle seed. Uh, I'll take that in a capsule, personally, and as well as dandelion. So as well, I mix that. So that's an, um, a support to take in between meals, but I'll also focus on taking the bitters. So those two things together to promote digestion, bile flow, and then to go and heal, actually heal the liver, actually um, heal any cirrhosis that's happening, any um, blockages that are happening. Um, I find that milk thistle is one of the best things. I actually notice if I don't take milk thistle in a time that maybe I have not been thinking about my liver too much, and I've been kind of ignoring it, um, and I'm not taking the milk thistle, my sleep is really affected. If I start back on that 
and I'm supporting, I'm being conscious of that, then um, I'm sleeping a lot better. So it's one of the ways I, I know. Um, I've also done geranium essential oil over the liver in a salve, and that will pull out toxins. Geranium oil on the... In a salve on your liver. Oh, a salve, yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's interesting. This is amazing information. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> um, all right, a few questions for you. So do you recommend fresh over dried herbs or dried herbs over fresh herbs, and why or why not? There are certain herbs that um, don't, when, when they're dried, they lose their they lose some of their components. They can't get them back when you rehydrate them. Um, one, for example, off the top of my head is St. John's wort. So that's something that's, um, if you're getting it, it, it only has a certain amount of growing season, um, wild or cultivated. So that's something you're going to want fresh. And when you're working with fresh herbs, you can't always do... Um, you might not want to do it as just an infusion because it's not going to be as shelf stable. It's not, it's not going to pull out as much. You're going to want to use an alcohol tincture. So that specifically is one that I know mm -hmm. you're going to want to use. There's, there's only a few that really lose a, a lot of benefits when you dry them. Um, I can't think of the other couple that I know. But other than those ones, you're really okay either way, dried or fresh. Okay. Um, next question is, how do you choose, um, or how does one choose, the specific extraction method for, like, maximum potency of trying to address an, a specific ailment? Yeah, with a specific ailment, um, you're just going to want to do tincture. Like, oh. that's, that's the one. Okay. <laughs> the one that is above all. all. Um, that in just in terms of pulling out the most constituents, having the, the fat-soluble and water-soluble right. molecules. Um, no other extraction method does that as well. Mm -hmm. So if it is for using it, you know, as a powerful medicine, that's the route you're going to want to okay. take, yeah. And, and so presumably if it's not for a medicinal purpose, it would just be whatever you sort of feel like. If it's <laughs> for maintenance, like I wouldn't take tinctures, multiple tinctures every single day for the whole year. Like that's just not something that I would want to do. Um, if it's just for maintenance, like a nutritive, like you're just kind of like wanting to get some more nutrients in, you're wanting to support your body. Like I would just go personally for more teas, like drinking instead of just having water or whatever other beverage, you're infusing herbs into your beverages. Um, or something like this. Like, I mean, these oximals will make a great uh, salad dressing and stuff like that. So you can really add them into your diet without have, feeling like you need to go, okay, I'm on my, like, medicine cabinet and I'm taking this tincture right. and this and this. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. This is kind of a weird question. Not that I do this, but is there any um, benefit to ingesting the herbs after they've been extracted in whatever extraction method? No. Um, okay. Not that I know There's of. no benefit. Not that I know So of, we no. do, we're playing around with fire cider this year, which has been actually amazing. Yeah. Um, and I'm like, we, should I be straining this? I, I literally just like eat the ginger pieces yeah. and garlic. and You could blend it know. up and make like a hot sauce. Yeah. Okay. That would be cool. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Cool. Thank yeah. You. It's not, it's not like they're fermented or anything. So in that case, because when you're using vinegar, you're not you're not lacto fermenting, so there's the, not you're not having like the good bacteria in there that you would um, have with a, like a lacto fermented veggie. So it's yeah, it's up to you. <laughs> um, I think yes. Hi Dana, for a newbie like me, um, with dandelion season coming on, I always hear about how often you can use. I'm going to use the root for coffee, apparently, mm -hmm. the leaves for my salad, and the flowers. I'm for tincture. I'm wondering what you've done with dandelion flowers, or Donna, or whoever might have use for dandelion. Yeah. It seems like a good place for a newbie to start. Yeah, yeah. I I use them for in a, a, a oil infu infusion. Um, the flower is good it, for topically for skin, so I would infuse the um, like a moisturizer lotion. Yeah, yeah. Like um, so, what I, I would do is infuse them in oil and leave that for two to four weeks to pull out. It'll be like a bright yellow oil. You mix that with either beeswax or coconut oil, right? You make your salve, and then you can apply that onto your skin. It makes great tea. And dandelion flower tea. So you cut the green part off, off of, yeah. so you've got just the little yellow fuzzy stuff, 
and you fill a mason jar with that and you pour cold water on that, let it sit overnight, put a bit of honey in it, strain it. It's a nice lemonade type of mm -hmm. drink. What I would just yeah. let to, to be aware of is that as soon as you pull the flowers and you like cut into them or anything, like they're often gonna have a, they're gonna go to seed, they're gonna get fluffy. And that can be a little bit off-putting, but it's fine. Oh, all right. Yeah. So, so use right away. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. If you try to dry dandelion flowers, it can be a mess sometimes. <laughs> they just will, on your drying rack, they'll just get puffy. And so when you, I, I know this is a dumb question, so then when you're going to mix it with your coconut oil or whatever, you take the goopy flowers out, now mm -hmm. you've just got your oil left. Yep. Okay. Good, yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Is there any negative to freezing any of these like infusions or anything like that? Because I'm honestly very bad at remembering what I should be drinking and all of that kind of thing. So if I was to make a nettle infusion and then like freeze the liquid in ice cube trays so that I have something easy, would yeah. that be negative or like would it be fine? To I do think that? it would be fine. Okay. Yeah, like freezing reduces some enzymes. In, uh, in plants, right? But I, I would do it still. <laughs> it's better than not having it or wasting it. Yeah, for sure. Dana, I just looked up so that I could give a better answer. Um, when, when drying dried or, or when using dried herbs, 80 to 90 proof alcohol, which is 40 to 50 percent alcohol, will usually suffice to properly extract and preserve that, the active constitutes in the plant material. Perfect. Thank you. No problem. Yeah. You can't get higher than 40% at the LCBO if they don't have it. I've asked. Yeah, I figured. <laughs> you can, if you know someone who has a still, right? you can get higher. Yeah. Um, going back to the anxiety thing, those are um, interesting options I hadn't actually considered. Um, I started taking... Um, ashwagandha, I guess you can take it in a powder, but apparently it tastes really nasty. Mm. Um, so I've been taking it in capsules, and I just take a capsule daily, and like within a week of taking it, um, my overall anxiety was just like, yeah. I couldn't believe the difference. Um, like I'm literally, like I don't want to go without that, you mm -hmm. know, because the difference is just tremendous. Yeah, it's yeah, supporting the, your... Um, and the brain fog and everything, like it's, yeah. That's <laughs> wonderful. Yeah, it's really neat. I'm happy for you. Okay. Sorry, just something about ashwagandha, because I've been taking it for a long time. You do have to take a break every couple of months, mm -hmm. so just go off of it for a couple weeks, and then you go back on it again, mm -hmm. just for safety's sake. Yeah, that's something to keep in mind for all, for all herbs, all medicine, right? They'll, uh, if you're on a medication, a lot of doctors will taper you off at certain points um, to keep its eff effectiveness and potency to give your body a break, like for whatever reason. So it's important if you're on a long-term protocol with herbs as well, like I would definitely recommend rotating. Yeah. You talked about being able to make your own shampoo using herbs. Could you tell us how to do that, please? <laughs> Um, yeah, so there is a method um, of, it's not for everyone, um, it's using, ben, um, no, Rasul clay, Rasul clay with a mixture of uh, herbs in it. Um, I actually, instead of a herb, herbal cleanse, I'll do a matcha, um, so it's like a powdered tea um, with clay, and then you can add, I would add rosemary. Um, rosemary stimulates uh, scalp health and hair growth. So uh, I would infuse water, ro rosemary and water, um, either a tea, like an infusion that way, or just overnight. Mix that with rasul, specifically rasul clay, because there's a cleansing property to that and it won't build up in your hair. It's a whole, it's a whole thing. So I'm, I'm not going to be explaining this correctly. I'll just kind of give you what I've done and mix that with some matcha and the matcha is a little bit of it doesn't bubble like it doesn't foam but it adds a little bit of that cleansing um and do that once or twice a week um rinse with apple cider a diluted apple cider vinegar that is a no shampoo method that is herbal and you can also in between use herbal sprays herbal rinses um that's pretty much like the there's more to it but that's kind of where I've done it um 
Also just herbs for hair care in general. Um, even if you don't do that method at all, apple cider vinegar diluted is a good incorporation as well as, yeah, rosemary um, and different herbs for scalp health. Uh, if you have any issue with dry skin on your head, you're gonna wanna, um, you can infuse it into an oil, into coconut oil or olive oil, and just keep that in your hair for a little while and then wash it out. Um, so that's how I like to do hair care specifically, yeah. Okay, anything else? <laughs> um, so last spring, I was um, uh, nursing my geese in the, chi in the kitchen, and um, I had a goose going blind. The eye was getting worse. Mm. And I used um, plantain, lamb quarters, dandelions, and um, there's one more. So they ate that more than the chicken food, and um, um, I snipped it up. My husband's like, they're really small. You have to snip this stuff up for them. Anyways, it healed the eye, um, and the herbs, um, there's omega-3s in some of them, mm. so that's really beneficial. Mm -hmm. But the eye cleared up. I thought I would have a, a goose to go blind, yeah. and the eye totally cleared up, so I was, like, thrilled. That's but amazing. once they got loose on the grass, um, they didn't go for the herbs. Mm. They just go for grass. So oh. if you had the contained, they, they were just eating what I had them yeah. um, in the cage. So it was interesting. Ah, that's awesome. Um, just just a bit of a caution, things like stinging nettle, you want to steam it before you consume it because you will end up with little pickies in your digestive tract and that is a nasty, nasty thing to experience. I bet. <laughs> well, I haven't, but I've heard yeah. it has been nasty. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm glad you don't know from experience. No, no. <laughs> Um, or if you dry it and then use it as a, in a tea. Um, so drying it does the same th effect as steaming or cooking it would. Uh, if you use it fresh, cook it. If it's dried, it's okay. It won't sting you if you touch it if it's dried. 